Hey, good morning. Today we are going to look at one of the classic stories of the Bible, the fiery furnace. Uh, if this story is familiar to you, which I'm sure it is for many of you, I want to encourage you as we read it together this morning to try and pretend that you don't know how it all ends. Um, I think if we can get our hearts into the experiences of some of these characters, it can sort of enliven what's going on. But uh, I also think many of us are familiar with this story, but maybe not all that familiar with uh, how it's actually written. Maybe you know the story, but you haven't read it like this in a long time. And um, it's actually not only the story that's important, but the way the inspired author tells it is important too. It actually highlights some of the monotony and foolishness of Babylon's idolatry versus the power of God and the resolve of his people. So let's read it together, Daniel chapter three. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace." Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever! You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. And the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the fiery furnace. 
Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command, and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. I wonder if we have any uh, firefighters listening to us this morning. Uh, you can probably appreciate, if you are, what's going on here a little better than, than most of us. When I was growing up, my dad was a firefighter, and I've heard a lot of tall tales from the fire station, but I've never heard a fire rescue story quite like this one. Uh, and the thing that might make this the greatest fire rescue story of all is that people in this case aren't saved from the fire, they're saved in the fire. They, they aren't snatched out just before the fire gets to them. They are walking around, protected by God, right in the midst of the flames. God is able to rescue his people. But faith isn't believing God will keep you from fire. It's believing that he'll be with you in it. And choosing to serve him then no matter what fires come. That's where we're headed this morning, but, but let's take a, a closer look together at what happens. First, there is a call to Babylonian civil religion. Uh, this, this incident at the fiery furnace shows a progression from the last chapter, if you were with us last week, where Daniel uh, interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar was having some very bad dreams. He was troubled. He couldn't sleep. And he actually threatened to kill all of his own prophets and magicians if they couldn't tell him what his dream was and what it meant. No one was able to do that except Daniel, who was one of the Jews that had been exiled from Judah into Babylon. And when Daniel does, the king publicly professes the greatness of Daniel's God. Uh, he acknowledges him as the revealer of truth and mysteries like no other God. And that's how the end uh, of chapter 2 uh, ends. But then here, just a few verses later, Nebuchadnezzar has gone from confessing the God of Israel as the God above all gods to now erecting a statue and demanding that it be worshipped. Why is that? Uh, maybe Nebuchadnezzar's uh, apparent faith at the end of chapter 2 was, 
sort of a foxhole faith. Maybe he acknowledged God when he was troubled, but once the trouble was gone and he was able to sleep at night again, uh, he just moved on. Foxhole faith is, is often not long lived. Is your God a God you turn to when you're troubled uh, and then ignore when that trouble is gone? When the anxiety goes away or uh, the health care starts to take its course, uh, when the test is finally over, where is God in our lives then? I think many of us have have filled the trenches of our lives, so to speak, with prayer only to all too easily become functional atheists once we're out. We've, we've questioned God as we've entered difficulties. We've called on him to deliver us when we're in those difficulties and then are tempted to ignore him once those difficulties are removed. Uh, maybe that's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe uh, Nebuchadnezzar's faith was, was sort of an eclectic faith. Maybe he thought that it was okay to still worship other gods so long as you considered Yahweh the greatest one. So maybe if, if Daniel had questioned him about this statue as he saw it coming up in the plain outside Babylon, the king would have said, well, sure, Daniel, your God is, is the God above the others, but there are still others. Uh, so yes, we acknowledge Yahweh, but we're going to continue worshiping this statue too. I think many people can functionally do the same thing and treat Jesus as one God among many in their lives. Maybe you've seen this. The, they worship money on Monday family on Friday, sports on Saturday, and then mix in a little Jesus on Sunday morning. And instead of the risen Christ being the, the central reality that animates and directs all the other pursuits of their lives, he's one God among many who has to wait his turn. Maybe that's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. Whatever it was, uh, sometime after his confession of faith, Nebuchadnezzar is now leading his nation into idolatry en masse. Uh, sadly, if you've been a believer for very long at all, you've observed this kind of public uh, apostasy before, this kind of public turning from the one true and living God. And it's, it's always deeply grieving. Um, <clears throat> I wonder what it was like for Daniel after seeing Nebuchadnezzar uh, at the end of chapter two, after he'd interpreted his dream and he sees the king publicly acknowledge Yahweh as God. And then to show up for work one day and see scaffolding going up around an idol. Maybe Daniel was, was savvy enough to know that politicians can be fickle, but I'd imagine it was, it was disappointing. And when that happens, I think it always reveals that there was, there was something off all along. Uh, as maybe you've heard it said, the faith that fizzles before the finish had a fatal flaw from the first. I think that's true. So Nebuchadnezzar sets up this statue. And in the last chapter, he'd had a dream of another statue made up of all kinds of different materials. Uh, if you remember, there was gold for the head and, and silver and then bronze and iron and clay. And Nebuchadnezzar in this dream was the gold head. But the whole thing ended up getting destroyed by this little stone uh, that represented the kingdom of God. Well, I don't think you have to do much digging around to sort of figure out what's going on here. Uh, this new statue is all gold. And so it represents Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon. And so apparently Nebuchadnezzar is trying to prevent his nightmare from becoming a reality by making a statue that's all gold and demanding that not just the Babylonians, but it says in verse seven, all the peoples, nations, and language, languages that they all fall, fall down and worship this golden image. 
I think when, when rulers are afraid, they try to manipulate the circumstances. Uh, when leaders are insecure, they respond out of their own insecurities and they do foolish things to try to control people and to control situations <clears throat> that are actually outside of their control. So Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> establishes this idolatrous civil religion to try to hold on to his power. And so he calls the entire empire to basically worship itself. Twice, back to back in verses two and three, it lists off the groups of all the people who assemble. Maybe as I read it, you thought, hey, could we get on with this, with the prefects and the satraps and all that good stuff? Um, all of these people have come to this assembly that's sort of like the State of the Union or the inauguration, these moments in the life of a nation when uh, everyone, the representatives and bureaucrats and military leaders and, and Supreme Court justices, everyone is there. And they, they stand outside in front of this golden statue that if you translate the cubits into feet, it's about 90 feet tall. <clears throat> to give you an idea, the, the Lincoln Memorial Building is 99 feet tall. So just imagine at the far end of the National Mall, you've got this huge statue with all the nation's leading figures uh, sort of gathered around it. And then a herald comes to the mic and says, when the orchestra plays, uh, complete with trigons, whatever those are, and bagpipes, uh, when they start to play, everyone should bow down to this statue that the king has, has set up. And the, the text specifies that this statue was set up in the plain, in the, in the plain area just outside the city. And we, we talked about this in chapter one, that this plain is the same place where in Genesis 11, the people set up the Tower of, of Babel. In Genesis 11, verse four, it tells us why they did that. It says, uh, they said to one another, the people said to one another, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So the people of Babel wanted to gain admiration and they wanted to avoid being broken up into smaller groups, into lesser kingdoms. They wanted their kingdom to be great and known and admired. And God saw that what they were doing was pursuing their own vain glory so that they would be renowned rather than making his name known in all the earth. And so God comes in Genesis 11 and he, he frustrates their plans and he separates their languages. And so now here on that same plane, Nebuchadnezzar is doing all he can to try to manipulate the circumstances to undo what God had done at Babel. He's trying to continue the, the same proud, rebellious aims of that first failed project. And he wants to reunite the people of the world, not in allegiance to God, but in allegiance to themselves, in praise of their own power and their pride and their kingdom, completely independent of their creator and Lord. Friends, you and I are probably not going out building towers and erecting statues, but every one of us were born with those same longings, uh, those same desires to make a name for ourselves and establish our own kingdoms over and above the name of God. We crave people's admiration and attention uh, we want our relationships and our houses and our jobs and our education and even our churches and our nations to be big and famous and fast and known because we so often prefer the admiration that comes from these outward senses of success. We prefer them to the well done 
we hear from God for service in secret. We prefer the fame that comes with being big to the disregard that comes with being faithful. And so we work building our own little towers and statues that build our pride. And when it starts to crumble, we can all too easily become little Nebuchadnezzars, foolishly trying to manipulate people and situations to hold it all together any way we can. But God is so remarkably kind and compassionate. Over and over again in the Old Testament, he is slow to anger and abounding in love that he comes to us in the midst of our rebellion and he makes a way for us to be freed from the penalty and the power of that idolatry and pride. And he does it through the cross and resurrection of Jesus. In this story in chapter three, nine times it says it over and over that the king sets up this statue and that the people bow down or fall down to this false idol. Even today, peoples around the world will fall down in droves in worship to false God that they've made, made with their own hands. But Jesus is the only true image of the only true God. And he was lifted up on the cross. And so Nebuchadnezzar raises up this gold statue to solidify his power. But God lifted up his suffering son for our deliverance. And as Philippians 2 says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we do not bow to the gods of the nations. We bow to the one who hung on a tree. But Nebuchadnezzar seeks to set up this idolatrous civil religion and the people of God in this circumstance respond with a civil disobedience. Next, these, these three uh, Judeans uh, respond to the demands of of Nebuchadnezzar, and it all starts with a false accusation. Uh, verse 8 says, At that time, certain Chaldeans, that is locals, they came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. Uh, we don't know exactly what was driving these accusers. Uh, we do know they were bureaucrats in Babylon, just like the three Jews were in this story. So a little professional jealousy isn't unlikely. Uh, the foreigners had beat them out of the top spot in the class at Babylon University, and then they got promoted over their heads, and it seems like they hadn't forgotten about it. Whatever it was, the, the text says it was malicious. So what they had in mind was not concern. They weren't there to work for the betterment of the kingdom because they saw some sort of disunity. Their motive was harm. If you've ever been wrongfully accused, uh, you know what these three might have been going through in this moment. It doesn't feel very good. And these accusers use some of the same tactics that are still popular today. Uh, first, they appeal to the vanity of the boss. O oh, king, live forever. You have made a decree and you promised these circumstances. And now these men who you appointed are disobeying you. So in other words, if you proud king don't do something about this, your reputation's at stake. And then second, they, they take points of truth and spin it. Uh, it, it was true that, that these three guys would not bow down to this statue. And apparently Nebuchadnezzar didn't know about this apart from the Chaldeans uh, sort of ratting those guys out. But uh, they add some color commentary in verse 12. They, they add, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. So they take the Jews' refusal to bow and, and they mischaracterize their motives. 
what the Jews did as an act of devotion to God, these guys spin as an act of disregard for the king. There's a lot of that kind of thing going on these days. Um, taking an observation about someone's actions and then pronouncing a supposed motive as if that supposed motive were just as factual as the thing that had taken place. Doing that is wrong, but it was just as effective then as it is now. Uh, in verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar completely flips his lid. Uh, he sa it says, in a furious rage, he commanded that these three be brought before him. Uh, we talked earlier about Nebuchadnezzar. Let's talk a little bit now about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, Daniel is not around for this one. Uh, we don't know if he called in sick for the statue dedication, um, but chapter one says that he was assigned to the king and the other three were assigned to the province of Babylon. So uh, in, in our day, it might be like uh, these three are assigned to the DC city government and Daniel works at the White House. Uh, they were in close proximity, but had different jurisdictions. Uh, these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are ordinary government officials. Uh, this moment in their lives is, is far from the norm. What makes it extra ordinary is that it's not ordinary. Um, after this one dramatic day, they are never mentioned again in the pages of Scripture. Uh, the same is true even for Daniel. By my count, we have a record in the Bible of nine days in Daniel's life. But it seems that he served the kings of Babylon for decades. So in decades of civil service, only two days of the lives of these three men are apparently notable. And so if you, if you do the logic, if you do the math, so to speak, from there, that means most of their days looked a lot more like coffee on the way out the door and a commute on the metro, uh, chats with the guard on the way in, emails, inner office drama, uh, checking on the contractors who were pruning the hanging gardens, making sure they don't go over budget, preparing for war against the Persians. Uh, these, these three lived in a radically different culture, but they lived generally ordinary lives, just like you and I do most days. But there came a day in their otherwise ordinary lives when their allegiance was severely tested. And I certainly hope you and I don't face any furnaces in our future, but days of, of testing will come for you too. And when that day came for them, they were ready. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar calls them in. He gives them a chance to, to change their minds and recant and worship this idol. But he says, if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Uh, this is no empty threat. Uh, Jeremiah 20, 29 tells us that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had already killed two kings in Judah by the same means. So this is, this is real, and they likely know this. What would you have done? Now, try to suspend the fact that you know how all this turns out. But would, would you have bowed down? Maybe you could justify it by sort of saying, you know, I'll bow down physically, but my heart won't be in it. You know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll worship the true God and outwardly I'll just do this because God sees the heart, right? Uh, maybe you could have reasoned, you know, I'll be more useful for the kingdom if, if I'm alive than I am if I'm dead. So uh, I'll bow down this one day so that I can be alive to serve God the next 10,000 days. Uh, if pragmatism was what was driving these three guys, they might've done something like that. But the issue isn't their usefulness, it's their devotion. Uh, the answer isn't pragmatism. The answer is that in this moment, they love God more than they love man. 
So Nebuchadnezzar closes with sort of a taunting question that elicits a response. He says, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And verse 16 shows how they respond. They answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So how in the world do you think these exiled government officials showed up to work on this day, ready to stand with that kind of resolve against a literally raging, violent king? And really the fact that they do this is all the more remarkable when you remember what got them here in the first place. The reason that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in Babylon is because their parents' generation and the generations before them had no problem bowing down to false gods. Uh, Every time the going got tough, they went looking for some other God and some other nation whom they could appeal to, to try to deliver them from their circumstances. So maybe after growing up in that environment and seeing the turmoil that idolatry had brought to God's people, these three were awakened to the reality that what God wants from them more than anything else is their trust. Maybe they had gone back in exile and read the 10 commandments And read in Exodus 20, where it says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that's in earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So maybe these three men had come to grips with the fact that God really is who he says he is. And he really is all we need. And so unlike the the generations in Judah that had gone before them, maybe they realized that God alone really is enough. And so when this extraordinary day of testing came, they were ready. I think this is an invitation for us to consider, are you and I ready for when this day comes in our lives? Again, it may not be something as severe as a death sentence. Uh, Lord willing, it won't be. Though for many of our brothers and sisters around the world today and in years past, uh, it has been. But the moments are coming for every one of us to determine where our allegiance really lies. And if you and I aren't ready, if you and I haven't sorted out where our allegiance lies, when the pressure comes, we will find reasons to be okay with bowing to other gods. Readiness for the extraordinary is determined by what we do in the ordinary. Our readiness for those extraordinary moments that are periodically presented to us are determined by what we have done in the millions of ordinary moments that lead up to them. Uh, I mentioned earlier that my, uh, my dad was a firefighter. And if you know a firefighter, you know that they spend far more time getting ready for emergencies than they do in emergencies. I'm, I'm sure my dad spent a lot more time washing fire trucks than he spent driving fire trucks. Uh, but day after day, year after year, they train, they, they prepare. Half of their calls are false alarms. Uh, most of the rest are not all that spectacular. But there was one day a few years ago when uh, on off hours, my dad was manning the grill at a pool party and he looked over and saw a fifth grade boy laying motionless in the bottom of the pool. 
he uh, immediately, without even thinking, dove in, pulled out this boy, and started CPR on an unresponsive 10-year-old. Eventually, this boy came to, and he recovered. And later that afternoon, that boy's parents held their son in recovery at the hospital instead of visiting him at the morgue. Because when an extraordinary moment came, someone was ready. Uh, Someone who had not spent their lives going from one extraordinary moment to the next, but someone who had spent ordinary moment after ordinary moment preparing. So friends, for you and I, the time to decide who sits on the throne of your life is not when the pressure comes. Uh, The time to decide who sits on the throne of your life is now. And the way you cultivate a a readiness to respond at those moments when testing come is by the ordinary means of grace that God's given us. The ordinary things like regularly reading his word, like communing with him in prayer, like being with his people and worshiping with them and serving your neighbors. None of these things seem extraordinary. But they are the ways that we cultivate the allegiance to Christ that he's worthy of. And after these three respond uh, to the king, their extraordinary moment becomes all the more extraordinary. Uh, The king is predictably enraged again. He orders the furnace uh, as hot as it'll get. That's what it means when it talks about seven times hotter. It just means as hot as this thing will get. Uh, The three are bound up, and the guards who were ordered to throw them in die themselves in the process. Um, But then we get a view of God in the fire. In this case, God chose not to rescue them from the fire. He rescued them in the fire. They went through the turmoil of living with a death sentence. They were bound by the king's guards. I wonder how long it took those guards to get them from the king's court to the furnace. And all that time, them not knowing exactly what the outcome was going to be. God did not spare them from that trial, but he was present with them in the midst of their trial. The resolve of faith that we see in them and that you and I are called to is not a resolve to believe that God will deliver us from our temporal circumstances. It's a resolve to live devoted to him even as we go through those circumstances. In verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar had asked, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And then after this incredible miracle in verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar answers his own question. He answers and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people or nation or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. To Nebuchadnezzar, the God who rescued these three men was still their God. He promotes them. He he respects their integrity and their resolve, but he still does not worship their God. It is so easy for us to think that if God would just prove himself, we'd believe in him. Uh, If he just showed us some miracles and did some tricks for us, then we would believe. But what we see over and over and over again in the Bible, including right here, is that just is not true. There are still so many people who will see these miraculous things happen and say, hey, that's good for you. I'm glad you found something for you to help you get through, but I want, I don't want anything of it for myself. 
I think typically what causes people to truly consider God as God is not when he's proven, but when they're broken. Uh, And we'll see this again next week, that what finally causes Nebuchadnezzar to truly worship the one true God isn't when God does a miracle. Nebuchadnezzar, by that point, has seen several of those. It's when God breaks his pride. Who is this God? The God who is in the fire with his people. Who is this God to you? Is he someone else's God, but not yours? Is he someone you respect and maybe even admire, but don't worship? What we'll see is the call of God is that we surrender our pride before in his providence, God takes it from us and give him our allegiance for ourselves. Friends, I pray that every one of us who considers uh, ourselves a follower of this true and living God because of what Christ has done will be able to say with the apostle Paul, I do not account my life of of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Father, we thank you for the promise and hope that you've given us that as we pass through our own fires, that you will be present with us in the midst. And Father, we thank you for lifting up your own son so that when we look to him in faith, uh, or we by the power of the Holy Spirit, can live lives of devotion and allegiance to him. So Father, I pray that you would help us in a fresh way today to, uh, Lord, count our lives as as not precious to us, uh, even as Paul did, even as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, but that more than anything, we would prize you and that we would devote ourselves to the advance of your kingdom even when the kings, kingdoms of this world uh, rage and call for our hearts. Father, would you fill us with a fresh confidence in you to live our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.